So we're about a week away from Halloween or so, and we're starting to get a little chilly here in San Diego, so I figured I'd give you a little fall tour of the garden, talk about what I have growing, what my plans are, my thoughts, and really, we're starting to get into the cold season of San Diego where it's like 50 degrees at night, so like that's as cold as it gets in this time of year. But it's starting to become apparent, and you'll see that some of the tomatoes are looking quite sad. The peppers are on their way out because it's just not warm enough for them. But what we do have is a bunch of different fall beds growing. So over here, I have a nice little brassica medley. And brassicas are probably my favorite plant to eat. Man, the brassicas are so nice to fill up your vegetable portion in your meals. And in front of me right here, this one that looks a little bit different is actually broccoli rob. And that is a style of broccoli that produces a lot more of these leafy greens. And it produces these small florets. And the idea is that you kind of chop the whole thing up and saute it, some olive oil, garlic, lemon. It's really wonderful, nice little snacking kind of broccoli. Um, next to that, I actually have broccolinis. So from here on to the end, is all broccolini mixed into this bed. And the reason why I have the broccolini and the broccoli rob here is that they're plants that grow a lot faster. You harvest them more frequently, and that is the closest to the entrance of my garden. Uh, if I put it somewhere far away, I'd probably forget about it, and then the bolting, and I wouldn't really get that much out of it. And for the same reason, I actually have a row of red Russian kale right up in front. And that's because, again, that's something I'm gonna pick more regularly. I wanna eat on a more regular basis. So I want it very accessible and visible in my garden. This is actually the first fall bed that I put in and it's looking really nice. It's really starting to fill in quite nicely. And for contrast, behind it, I have a little taste of summer here. And that is three determinate tomatoes. So these are the last kind of hurrah of tomatoes I put in ground. I wasn't expecting them to be growing all through the winter because they are a determinate style tomato. So what I'm planning is, I actually have a couple setting right now and a couple ripe ones in here. The idea behind these determinants is that they'll produce a big batch of tomatoes maybe into early November and or mid-November and I will be able to make a last batch of sauce to preserve that last taste of summer before we get into that winter. And I still have a bunch of flowers mixed in. So here I have some zinnias and I actually still have a lot of basil left over that's beginning to flower. Beyond that, I am starting to pepper in some of my more cool season flowers. You'll notice that I have like calendulas starting to mix in. I still have the alyssums, which are growing quite well even throughout the winter. They're really an all purpose kind of flower for me here in San Diego. They do great all year round, which is fantastic. Now, this big raised bed is my broccoli machine. So in here I have a bunch of heading style broccolis. These are more of like the traditional crowning type broccolis where you get a nice big head. You could cut and come back and it'll keep producing all those tasty side shoots, which personally is actually my favorite part. I, as much as I love that big head of broccoli, my favorite are the little side shoots with the leaves. I don't know, something about that head broccoli, it's like the least interesting brassica to me, but I definitely still love eating it. So this is where I had all of my um, indeterminate tomatoes before, which I had growing on this trellis kit. So I had that string coming down and I actually still have the last holdout here, which is the sun gold tomato. Things like cherry tomatoes will still do well, even as the sunlight hours and temperatures are decreasing because they don't need that much to produce a small tomato like this, which is wonderful. So the sun gold is kind of the last in-ground tomato I have growing in here. But the rest of it, again, is broccoli and some flowers again. I have some violas in the corners, more calendulas, and I might pepper in a few more. You see I have like an Alaska variegated nasturtium. So I do want a lot of color in my garden because as you get into that fall winter, you tend to get a lot of things that just look green. And I love green, but I do want a little pop of color here and there. Now as I walk over here, I'll point out that I have my carrot bed. So this carrot bed was actually sown in um, summertime. So the idea behind that is that you want to start your carrots while it's still warm enough for them to grow. But then what you really want to do is actually start harvesting them closer to that winter time. Because as it gets colder, carrots will actually naturally produce sugar as a source of like antifreeze. So what will happen is they'll sweeten up to stop themselves from freezing and getting damaged. And for us, that's fantastic because that's how you get sweet carrots. If you have a more bitter carrot, that's probably because it was grown in the heat and maybe with not enough water. So these are a little bit small, but I do need to thin this. So that's actually perfect. I'll leave those there for now. I might come back and snack on them. And over next to me is my curly kale. So you guys have probably seen this a lot of different times. It's been a mainstay in my garden now for about two years. And it's a really wonderful plant because it's never ending producer. 
It's great in soups, super great way to get a lot of nutrients in your soups. And the really cool thing about it is that you could always cut them back and they will regrow a second stalk. So that's what's happening here. And actually this one as well has a second stalk coming out of the base. Great plant, easy to maintain. I do almost literally nothing and it's actually mostly watered down here by this small Oya. And that's doing most of the work. Added a little sprinkler here because I might expand out this way. But man, this plant, two years running, tasty leaves year round, wonderful. Coming down this way, I'll talk about the celery again really quick. Um, it's just really nice plant to have around because I don't know about you guys, but when you buy celery at the store, you generally only need like a few stalks because you're making like a soup or something like that. And so you buy that whole bunch of celery and then you don't really want to eat the rest and you end up composting it. So the nice thing about growing your own celery is that you basically just get an infinite amount of stalks whenever you want. Come out here, grab a couple, chop them up for dinner. And you don't have to worry about it. This plant's been in the ground now for, I don't know, maybe six months. And it's just continuously producing these stalks and it's really easy to come out and harvest. And if you're into celery, you can snack on it too. <laughs> but as we come down this way, we'll get into my eggplant bed. So this eggplant bed is fully perennialized in a sense. And what I mean by that is that they have been growing in place here now for uh, the oldest plant, which I believe is this guy here, is now coming up on three seasons. So three full like summers. And the ones to right and left of it are now coming into their full second season they finished up. And then behind me is actually a first season plant. So this is a different style. It has a lighter color to it compared to this guy, which has this more kind of darkish purple hue to it. But they're both kind of that Asian style eggplant. They're really wonderful to cook really quickly. They steam up nicely, saute wonderfully. I really love growing these eggplants because again, they don't require that much work. And even when I got a really bad spider mite infestation on these, all I did is I cut off all the leaves, all the branches, and they just regrew. And I actually only did that two months ago. And I've been getting a never ending bounty of eggplants still. And that has to do with the fact that they are two and three year old plants, which means that they actually have a really established root system. If you think about a plant that you've only put in the ground for like four or five months, its roots are not gonna be able to go that far out. But these plants have been in the ground for three, three years. So what that means is those roots are now like searched for every scrap of nutrients and water that they could get. And it's made them really resilient. So I'm having a hard time getting rid of them, even though I really do think that I should probably move them somewhere sunnier. They just produce so well here that I'm probably gonna leave them here forever. In between each plant on either side, I have a set of fava beans. So these fava beans will grow all throughout the winter. In about a month, I'll probably trim these eggplants back entirely so they won't really have any leaves left. And that'll give the fava beans access to the sun. And the fava beans will build the soil next to the eggplants and help take up some of that water so the eggplants don't drown over the winter. That's one of those keys that I talk about in my overwintering peppers and eggplant video, which you should definitely check out. I'll put a tag at the end of the video for you guys to see that one. But as we come over here, there's actually a forest and that forest is my asparagus patch. So this has been a really fun plant to grow. I actually had no idea, first of all, that asparagus grew this way. Second thing I didn't realize is that asparagus got this bushy and this tall. These are all flopped over. If they were like able to stand fully erect, they'd probably be about seven feet tall now, which is absolutely wild for something that just produces little spears in the ground. So the way to think about asparagus is that in the springtime, you're getting all those spears to eat. And then everything after that is just energy collection. This is basically a gigantic solar bank of solar panels. And what it's doing is it's soaking up all that energy, pushing it into the crowns or roots. And then in springtime, all that energy is released in the form of all those spears. So the longer it could grow like this, the better, because it'll be a bigger harvest in the springtime. That's kind of the goal here. But of course, this will die down and start turning brown, and I'll have to cut it back all the way down. That's totally fine. At that point, I will probably spread down some mulch and compost, and then in the springtime, I'll be getting all sorts of spears. I'm definitely looking forward to that. So coming out of this section, I have a little bare patch here. This is where I had some chard. I might plant chard again, but for now, I'm probably going to actually try to fill it with some flowers. I'm actually thinking of throwing some chamomile in here. So we'll see how that goes. But in this section, I have a little bit of a sad update. <laughs> I said I had my um, rhubarb here. And then one day I noticed that it was just like all died back. And I can't even find the crown anymore. And what I found was instead like 300 roly polies or pill bugs. 
And they just absolutely wrecked my rhubarb, which I never thought would happen. I never would have guessed that roly polies would take out my rhubarb. Now to my right is a bed of cabbages. I have a mix of green and reds or purple cabbages and they're starting to grow a little bit, but really you can see right now they're in full shade and that's mostly due to this guy right here. So I'm thinking I'll probably cut this asparagus back in about a month and then I'll open the light on these cabbages right here. Now over here is actually a really fun plant. It's actually become one of my favorites aesthetically because look how giant these leaves are. This is a Trombusino squash. So this is the kind, let's see if I can find any. There's some that actually fail to form, but basically they're these sort of summer, you could eat it as summer squash, but it's really a winter squash. But they make these long curled squash with like a bulb on the end. And it's quite tasty, but really, I gotta say, I love the plant the most. The leaves are amazing. They're so large and just look really wonderful against my dying back grape. Now, down at the base here is actually garlic bed number two. I planted a full garlic bed in a previous video, and actually now you can start seeing this garlic is coming up. The difference is that this is all my soft neck garlic. So this part of my garden doesn't get quite as cold as the other one, which is why I put my soft necks here, because hard neck likes a lot colder, or it likes much cooler temperatures in order to succeed. So this is all my soft necks, and I probably need to plant one more garlic bed still, but <laughs> we'll have to figure out where to put that later. But I'm very excited for this garlic crop this year because this year I have all my garlic on irrigation, which is basically essential. Last year I learned that the hard way. Right here is my cucumber trellis. So I'm calling it my cucumber trellis because this is where I grew cucumbers, cucumbers all summer long. And now it's become my pea trellis. If you look down here, I have quite a few peas. So the beauty of peas is that you can plant them really tight together and they will still produce really well. It's a little trickier when you get into like springtime and you start getting more powdery mildew. But for this time of year, they just look so good planted up along this trellis. The idea is that they'll climb up, cling onto this, and I'll get a ton of peas. All these are shelling peas. If you guys haven't tried growing shelling peas, you're really missing out because the peas that you get at the store, or maybe you're thinking frozen peas or canned peas, they're just not the same. They don't have that sweetness. and the peas that you grow in your own garden are so incredibly delicious. Believe me when I tell you that you'll probably never even bring them into the kitchen because you'll be out here snacking on them all day every time you see them. And if anyone else finds out that you have your peas here, they're probably going to compete <laughs> with you for them. Next to those peas are actually some more heading broccolis. You might sense the theme that I really like brassica plants because all throughout my garden there's broccoli. Now next to the perennial kind of flower patch, what's going on here is I have my Shasta daisy which was fully cut back. So you could see some of these dead stalks, but it's now coming back nicely. And in front of it is the four o'clock color blast. And you might be wondering what sort of all these leaves are that are growing all throughout this. And it's actually a sweet potato. So this is a sweet potato. Funny story is uh, we planted a sweet potato um, last year and we put it right here and we got this amazing harvest of sweet potatoes like this big. So I was like, all right, great, whatever. That was a total failure, but apparently one of those sweet potatoes stuck behind because this over here is by far my biggest bounty of sweet potatoes I think I've ever got. And I think the secret here is that they started so early since they were kind of, they grew by themselves really, that what happened is that they had so much time to develop these giant tubers and now they're bursting out of the ground. I could see three sweet potatoes like this big now, and they're, they've literally dug themselves out of the ground because of how well they've been growing. So I'll do a harvest on that pretty soon here, but I'm really excited about that. The last little bit I'll say is that here is my grape. So obviously now it doesn't look great, and it's a very natural part of the grape's life cycle is that as you get out of summer and into winter and fall, the grape will drop its leaves, which is exactly why I put it here, because as these leaves drop, that opens up that sunlight back into my garden. In the summertime, as it fills up, it provides a little bit of shade in my garden, which is really nice. But this is really wonderful because I'm make, making use of all of the space in my garden, getting as much light as I possibly can captured. I actually got like 10 or 12 bunches of grapes this year. So that was really exciting. This is only a two year old plant and it's literally, if I were to pull out the longest stem, it's probably like 30 feet long. So that's the majority of what's kind of growing in this garden. Let's go take a look at the other garden, which is the more in-progress one that's still being planted out. 
So I actually do have a smaller container area over here that's mostly vegetables. But I wanted to talk about what my green stock plans are this year. So in this one here, which is the five pocket or the five tier style, which has the bigger pockets, I have heading broccoli up top. This is called Bell Star. It's a variety. And then what I have are some of the leftover peppers that I might overwinter directly in the green stock just to see how that does. But the main goal here was to figure out how to grow Chinese cabbages without getting a cabbage full of earwigs. So my plan here is that by putting them up in these green stocks, they will be off the ground, a little bit more protected from things like pill bugs and earwigs. And hopefully we'll actually be able to get enough cabbages to make some like kimchi, or really we just love eating the Napa style cabbages in every single different way. So this next one over here is the seven tier, which has the smaller pockets. So what I have since they're smaller is I actually have broccolini on the top row because it has a shorter life cycle than a regular heading broccoli. And then everything underneath it, all six rows underneath is entirely garlic. This is a kind of an experiment. So in general, I don't think the garlic will do well in the sense that it'll produce nice big heads by June because I think this will get too hot for the garlic to be quite happy. But what I will get is a bunch of young garlic. So young garlic is where you get basically like a green onion thickness of garlic all the way down. And instead of getting all the cloves, you have just like a little swollen head at the bottom. And the great thing about it is that you chop up the whole plant from the stem all the way up to the green leaves and you cook with it. And it has this really nice nuanced garlic flavor. A lot of people in my family really like it. So I figured I'd grow a tower of it so I could share with them. So we'll see how that goes. I'll definitely keep you guys updated on that. But walking through here, I have some trees that I haven't decided where to put yet. This is actually a yerba mate, just like the tea. And I wanted to see if it would survive the winter before I made a decision on where to plant it in ground. So this is a little bit of an experiment. We'll see how it goes. And next to that, I have a loquat. Again, I'll figure out that later. But over here are the container vegetables I have left growing for the season. I lied to you a few times when I said that those were my last tomatoes over there because I actually have some over here and I have some in ground that I'll show you in a second. But these are growing in the air pots, the 10 gallon air pots. And I'm using these Texas tomato cages to support them. These are both winter style tomatoes. The one over here is called Winter Stupis, Stupice, which is, has winter in the name. And then this one over here is an early girl, which is a classic early season tomato that does well in the winter. Beyond that, I have some more of these ultra hot peppers, which you'll see me and Kevin eating in an AMA video where I almost died. Um, but beyond that, I actually have some, again, Napa cabbage, but in a container that's growing quite nicely. And then I have some broccoli in these bags here. And a little broccolini, I wanted to basically try to grow everything I have in ground in a container for a comparison for you guys. But let's take a look over here in the other major side of the garden. So I have these onions here, which I'm probably going to pull. I don't think they're gonna head and they've been in the ground for too long. I think they'll bolt instead of actually grow properly. But over here in this gigantic bed where I had my tomatoes, I actually have a field of brassicas now. So you'll see that they don't necessarily look like the healthiest plants right now because they were just transplanted in and they've only really been in the ground now for two days. But all the new growth looks really wonderful. And the other thing you'll probably notice is that a lot of them have chew, uh, chew marks or leaves missing. And that's been just the cabbage loopers. They are prolific this time of year, those little white butterflies. And so what I did is I actually have applied BT. BT is one of the only sort of pesticides that I'll use because it's just a bacteria that targets caterpillars alone. And you're not gonna find things like monarch butterflies eating your cabbages. So you're only really going to actually specifically target that cabbage looper. And that makes me feel pretty okay about using it. So up front, all broccoli, cauliflower, broccolini. And I have mostly the cheddar style cauliflowers because those yellow heads, in my opinion, taste a lot better than the regular white heads. In this section, I have all cabbages running all the way down. This is a variety called tiara, which I started from seed from Johnny's. It makes these smaller sized cabbages that you could use for like a single meal instead of like a huge honker that you have to make sauerkraut out of. And then in the very back, I have the Brussels sprouts. They're going to be the longest growing crop in this bed. So I put them further back so I could deal with stuff up front more easily. Like once these are harvested out, I'll be able to plant here without those um, Brussels sprouts blocking the light. So that's kind of the main plan here. You'll see I have kind of a bean pathway down the middle where it's a little bit depressed. I might mulch it to distinguish it. Overall, I like to leave my beds unmulched in the winter time because it helps them heat up more. Because this black compost is gonna act as a heat sink. But as I get into like spring and summer, I definitely want mulch on all the beds because I want to keep it as cool as possible to make these guys happy. 
walking by over here, as I said, I lied to you. I actually said that my last tomato was over there. But I actually have three more tomatoes here. Again, these are all winter style tomatoes. I have a sun gold, which is cherry. And then I have a, a Castellino Genovese, which is a, another kind of early season cold tomato. And actually, there's even one right here. There's a little bit of diatomaceous earth on it because I have all these stink bugs, which are driving me crazy. That's why they have all these little yellow spots on it. They've been biting up my tomatoes and generally making me sad. But the thing that does make me happy is this pollinator patch. And the pollinator patch has been kicking all year and it's really done wonderfully. In particular, there's the straw flowers, which I just wanted to show you guys really quick. You'll see that these are all much shorter and these are much taller. This is a straw flower patch that's been in the ground since April of this year. I haven't done anything besides mowing off the top every couple months and letting it refresh. So what happens is you cut it down the base and you get all these little side shoots that start to form and then you get more flowers. So what I do is I cut half of it down, let the other half remain in flower. And then once this starts flowering, I'll cut back this half. And I basically get free flowers, never ending year round and they look wonderful. And the bed actually next to me is the last little bit of peppers that are in ground. You'll see that most of them have been actually chopped back pretty severely. In particular, if you take a look at these right here, you'll see that it's pretty much just sticks. So this is the process of overwintering the peppers. Like I mentioned, you could do that with eggplants as well. All of these will be dug out of the ground because I can't sacrifice this much area to just have peppers sitting there. But the other thing I'll point out really quickly is that the bikino pepper you'll see actually looks good. So the bikino pepper, for whatever reason, seems to do really well in these cooler months. It doesn't really bother with like the heat. So actually, even into winter time, they'll still be developing and ripening peppers. So I'm definitely leaving the bikino in ground. This pepper has actually been in ground now for two years. I just kind of work around it because I can't sacrifice it. It's doing so well. Um, actually, this is a previous video as well. This is the squash tunnel trellis. And the squash kind of went in the ground a little bit late, but it is now actually starting to grow. And you can probably see there's a huge honker of a kakuza squash right there. Uh, that's <laughs> actually a little bit overripe. I left it there so you guys could see it. I prefer to pick them when they're probably about half that diameter. It's still edible, it'll just be a little tougher and I'll have to probably cook it in a pressure cooker, make like a nice bean and kakuza stew. But the other thing is the garlic bed. So this is one of the most recent videos. This is a bed of entirely hard neck garlic. And again, you can see it's all come up. It's all sprouted. So what I did is once it sprouted, I actually added another inch of compost on top and then I added a layer of straw. I'll probably keep adding straw to this in, in relation, like in comparison to the brassicas where I said I leave the beds unmulched. They can benefit from a little bit of heat, but the garlic I want to stay as cool as possible because I don't really want it to grow that much now. I want it to get established, but the main growth is really going to be in spring. So it's looking really healthy. I'm really pleased with it. Again, it's on irrigation. So I think I actually have a chance of getting a massive garlic crop. So this last bed here is my first no dig bed. It's a giant bed that I kind of built just out of compost and straw. And it's been doing pretty well overall. What I have here is actually my second earliest plantings of brassicas. So this is actually all going to be a mix of cabbages right here. You can see they're even starting to form their little heads. They're starting to close in on themselves. And on this side, I have cauliflower. So again, I'm growing only the cheddar and the white style of cauliflower. I've decided not to grow the purple this year because I just don't think it tastes good enough to be worth it. And then in the farthest section over there are my other Brussels sprouts. So <laughs> I think I'm maybe a little overcommitted on Brussels sprouts. I'm definitely not overcommitted on brassicas because like I said, this household can eat brassicas. So we're going to be eating this all throughout the year. I'm very excited for it because we're probably not going to have to buy anything from the grocery store for quite a while. But let me show you one part of my garden that I actually rarely show you guys. And it's actually a pretty substantial container garden of perennial things and flowers. So let's go take a look back over by the other garden. So again, this is the section of my garden that I don't show you guys that often, but it's my container zone, mostly of perennial things and trees and flowers. But first off, I actually have my Birdie's 8-in-1 raised bed here, which is my herb bed. And up front, front and center, is the pineapple sage, which is finally starting to flower, looking absolutely wonderful. These are great flowers to throw in a drink. They have a nice little sweetness to them, a little bit of nectar at the bottom. That's why the hummingbirds love them. Walking through here, I have a mix of different sort of cane crops like raspberries, blackberries that are thornless, and actually a couple different mints that are just starting to regrow after I cut them back. 
as I come down, I have some lemongrass, a little bit more herbs, and over here is a giant bush of Thai basil, which I probably am ready to give up on, because it's not give up on, but ready to let go, because it's now fully flowered. It smells great, it still tastes great, but I just don't need that much. Coming down, I have a Hawaiian guava. I'm starting to get really obsessed with guavas, and you'll see a few more in a moment here. But over here, I have my blueberries, which these blueberries are crazy heavy producers. They have a huge pot, which I think is the big benefit here. If you do grow blueberries, I suggest going bigger than you think. I'd say probably a 15 gallon pot would be ideal for blueberries in my experience. Um, over here is actually a very uninteresting looking container. And this is mint, again, so when, whenever you have mint growing and it starts to look a little bit raggly, like a little ratty and loose and just not very good, you could just cut it entirely back and even rip most of it out of the ground and just cover it with some compost and it'll come back, which is exactly what's happening right here. Coming down through this section, I have my bear's lime, which is doing wonderful in a container. I have my Fuerte Avocado, which is in a 10 gallon air pot. Again, it's the best looking avocado I've personally ever grown. It's looking absolutely wonderful. And then to the right of that is my bay leaf tree. So that I actually use for cooking all the time. And behind it is a pomegranate, which is actually starting to set a little pomegranate there. It's a little late in the season, so I don't know where it's gonna go. But over here, I have mostly these kind of flowering and tree style things. So this is actually a moringa. Uh, it's one of those superfoods where you could eat the whole entire plant. This is the first time I've tried growing it. The leaves are apparently really delicious and full of nutrients and you just throw them in soups and it's wonderful. And this guy over here is a, a butylon. So butylons are these really wonderful flowers. They kind of hang down and look like little lanterns. We have three different styles of butylons here, but this one's probably our favorite because it has these kind of stripy, nice multicolored flowers. And the hummingbirds and butterflies seem to really enjoy them as well. Behind that is actually two different pineapple guavas. They're kind of hidden in here, but let's see, it might have, oh, there's actually a fruit right there. So this is a fiosia or pineapple guava. This is one of these plants that I picked up for $10 in a one gallon container, planted it in a 15 gallon pot, and it's just been going like crazy. I've picked maybe eight of these this year, and that's after only just one year. But the real stunner is actually the strawberry guava. Strawberry guava, has absolutely amazed me. Again, this is one of these plants I picked up. It was probably about this big a year ago. And now look at this thing. It's absolutely covered in fruit. Every single branch has like a dozen fruits on it. And the nice thing about these is that they ripen slowly over time. They turn bright, like a deep, dark reddish purple color. And they're really delicious as like little snacks. That's actually, most of them are just eaten right off the plant as they come but they have these little tiny seeds in there that are basically like metal BBs, so be careful, you don't want to bite into that. And this little corner over here is mostly roses, and these are different kinds of roses. I have a climbing rose on this trellis back here, which is actually about to flower for the first time, so we'll see what that color looks like. But most of these roses haven't really flowered much except for this guy, which is the iconic lemonade, I believe. Really wonderful fragrant rose, and we're trying to make these all organic so we could use them for cooking. We want to use the petals to kind of infuse different things. So that's something we're going to experiment with this year. But beyond that, I have another abule on here. So you can see they come in different shapes, sizes, flower colors. Really wonderful flowering plant to have in your garden. And behind that is actually a apple. So apples are technically part of the rose family, so that fits with my rose theme here. But this has been a spalliade quite nicely on this trellis, and it's actually starting to produce a nice little crop of winter apples here. Next to that, this wonderful flower here is a plumeria. It's very, uh, it's so fragrant. It's a wonderful nighttime flower too, because they generally open in the nighttime and they provide pollen for things like moths. So I love having plumerias. Over here in San Diego, they also just grow really well. Beyond that, there's really just a few more, like another butylon, another rose. That's really it for the tour, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed seeing this little section of the garden I don't show very often. Let me know if there was any part of the garden that you want to see a little bit more details about. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.